Welcome, uh, good afternoon, and thank you for joining us. Really excited to be here today to talk to you a little bit about the Department of State's journey with Databricks and establishing a uh, lake house architecture to support uh, security analytics. So we'll jump right in. Uh, by way of introductions, my name is Tim Ahrens. I am a technology leader at the Department of State, and I work under the CIO, uh, leading application design and delivery for the department. Uh, one of those systems that I support is our uh, Center for Analytics technology stack. We'll talk a little bit about what the Center for Analytics is here in a minute. Um, along with me, I have my colleague, Ed Mo. Ed is our platform uh, branch chief for the Center for Analytics. And he is not Brendan Barsness, who you see listed on the slide. Uh, unfortunately, Brendan, who is one of our partners from Deloitte Consulting, help, helping implement this, uh, had an emergency and could not travel. So you're stuck with the two of us, but we'll, we'll try to make it fun. So that is, uh, that is us in terms of introductions. Um, we're going to get into the challenge, kind of some of our approaches that we've taken thus far um, and, and some lessons learned. Uh, but first, a, a little bit about the Center for Analytics. So the Department of State Center for Analytics, or CFA for short, is the enterprise data management and analytics organization at the Department of State, um, led by the chief data officer uh, in partnership with the CIO and powered by data.state. We enable uh, analytics, data science, uh, data management, and provide technology as a service to support all of the things that we need to do with our data. Ed and I both lead the business and technical aspects of that tech platform, uh, and, and we'll talk a little bit about that here in a second. Um, the Center for Analytics is organized in four units, as you can see here. Um, we combine all of these groups together to partner with our overseas missions, right? Our embassies, consulates, and posts across the globe, um, as well as our domestic offices and uh, with senior leadership to tackle some of the biggest data challenges that the department faces. Um, as I mentioned, data.state, that is our technology platform. Um, it is an ecosystem that supports connecting to data, storing and managing data, trans you know, the transformation of data and joins, as well as ultimately the visualization of data. Um, so that is data.state in a nutshell. I'm happy to answer questions more about kind of the data.state ecosystem and our Center for Analytics afterwards, um, but let's jump right into the challenge uh, that we all face. Um, so, before we, before we hit the challenge, a little bit about the requirements. Uh, for my federal colleagues that are, that are in the audience, you guys are probably very familiar with uh, OMB's M2131. Uh, this is a federal mandate. For those that aren't as familiar with it, I'll, I'll, I'll break it down just a tiny bit. Um, but this would take a whole session just to unpack. Um, so as you can see the definition here on the screen, um, I will summarize that. Simply put, um, it is about logging, monitoring, and enablement. Um, and within that logging, monitoring, and enablement, um, what, you're, what we're essentially doing is looking across our landscape of federal information systems, tracking what we are logging today and what gaps exist. So that's kind of the baseline, establish a baseline of what we have today. And then once we've established that baseline, fill in those gaps, make sure that we're capturing all of those logs, centrally managing that information, and then maturing that capability set from the baseline to an understanding of um, where all of that data is and you know, advancing that so that we can support um, all of the things that we need to do in the security analytics space, which includes, of course, uh, incident response and remediation. So over to the challenge. Um, I'm sure like many of you all, um, our organization started with a physical data center, right? So we had an on-prem physical data center that we manage, the State Department manages, um, and we then expanded that into multiple physical data centers, geographically diverse. Next, we introduced cloud. Um, and, we, and we really kind of in earnest introduced cloud back in 2016, 2017. Um, you know, federal is always a little slow at things, but I think we were actually um, somewhat on the cutting edge in, in, in having some enterprise applications running at cloud scale. Um, and so we did that in a GovCloud. Then we added an additional GovCloud. Um, and lastly, and more recently, we've introduced some commercial cloud environments. Um, and so we've, we're operating this um, hybrid multi-cloud ecosystem with still some on-prem uh, things that are happening. So we've got data that is really sitting all across this ecosystem. We have hundreds of systems that are being operated out of, you know, out of this entire ecosystem, um, many of which are run by 
dozens of different bureaus, so organizational units in the State Department, um, that in some cases have their own budgets and their own management structures and controls. So information is really spread across. Um, and what we're trying to do is, of course, get a grip on all of this information and think smartly about how do we manage that. Um, so data is everywhere. We have multiple logging, scanning, and monitoring solutions. Um, and often we copy that data and dump it all into a larger data environment so that we can do additional scanning. Sound familiar to some of you? It probably does. Um, on top of all of the kind of the technical environment, we of course have policies and business process that we need to evaluate. And so we need to look at the policies that exist today and think about how are these mandates changing those policies? What do we need to do to actually affect that change? Do we need to introduce new policies? Um, and we also need, of course, executive sponsorship. It's always key. Um, so thinking about what do, what do we have today and how can we bring in those people early, um, that was really critical as we were thinking through this challenge. Um, we need to track the progress, right? And we, for, for federal government, we have to report up to OMB um, in terms of metrics of how we are complying or where we're going to be in compliance. Um, and then there's the challenge of working across the business to migrate information or collect that information from existing systems and also deal with those new systems that are coming online in parallel. So it's really a lot that we're dealing with. Um, I'm going to hand it over to my colleague Ed, who's going to talk a little bit about our technical approach. All right, so I get to talk about the fun part. Um, so, and like as, as uh, Tim mentioned, so we're down Brendan. Um, so if there's anything that's particularly clever here, feel free to give him credit. If I say anything that sounds what, overly, uh, overly crazy, feel free to give me credit for that. So to respond to the challenges that Tim described, we worked with cyber and IT leaders across the department to establish the enterprise log data lake house architecture. And so at its core, this is basically a hub and spoke model where we have a central analytics hub that coordinates with, node, with data processing and storage nodes distributed across the many enterprise clouds to build a central reporting platform and analytics platform. And then under the hood, right, this is a federation of Databricks workspaces across these, these environments. So IT systems and other log data sources are continuously generating terabytes of log data that lands in low cost object storage, ideally at one of the closer nodes. That data is then ingested at the node, processed at the node, and made available for queries from the hub. At the hub, a user, and here we're thinking about a security operations analyst, but it, but it could be, there's lots of other um, personas here that could be involved, initiates a federated query, which is pushed down to all of the nodes. The nodes respond with just the relevant results, which are then seamlessly consolidated back by the hub to provide that response to the, to the query. This response can be connected to existing capabilities, even something like Splunk. It can also be connected to cloud native or, or net new capabilities. And the user can use Databricks or other tools to conduct in-depth investigation of this data in essentially real time. By keeping the vast majority of log data in the nodes, we significantly reduce the data egress costs between clouds, between regions, and we limit data duplication. In, in our prior example, I mean, we, we can end up with many times, I mean, some, by one estimate, as much as 11 times duplication across different entities managing and processing data. So this allows us to reduce these costs, provide central governance, and, and central visibility across hundreds of systems. I'll pass on some lessons learned through the process. So in terms of ensuring that the right folks have the right access to the right data, right? We've been hearing about this all, all day at, the, uh, at this conference. And this is important for practical security. It's also really important for selling the dream. We have to get a lot of people on board with sharing their data, with making their data available. And so we've proven and, and demonstrated how we can use SQL rules in Databricks to map row and column level security. All the things you've seen with Unity Catalog. Unfortunately, if you are in Azure government, you don't have Unity Catalog and there's not a clear ETA on when that's going to occur. But hopefully Databricks and uh, Microsoft will make that happen soon. In terms of data processing, logs often share common formats. And so initial processing can be accelerated by building common and flexible parsers that can be applied to large swaths of collected logs. And so we can quickly deploy these parsers across the nodes, making logs available and actionable sooner. And so this is basically the idea of write once, apply multiple times. Think about iterative processing, 
iterative standardization over time as you develop new, as you make your process more complicated, as you make your process more fit for purpose. We found that Databricks Autoloader was excellent for handling the three primary use cases. So that's ad hoc queries for investigation, scheduled queries for reporting, and then also continuous queries for monitoring and alerting. And so to anyone working with this, test out Autoloader if you haven't. Additionally, depending on how your autoloader jobs are set up, you can create a lot of small parquet files and create this sort of explosion of tables. And here we found that delta optimizations were very, were very helpful. So in some cases, just with basic, basic optimization, um, we were able to get query response time improvements of around 80%. So just really huge improvements by, by doing a little bit of work on that. And then I mentioned kind of the iterative medallion architecture, right? We're talking about raw to bronze, raw bronze uh, data to silver to gold. You know, each of these success, successively improving the quality. Um, so one note here, just before you get too far down this path, you know, think about the final query structure so that you're creating uh, flexible tables, aggregate tables, ways to avoid doing extraneous queries or multiple queries to generate essentially the same data. It's straightforward, but a little bit of thinking up front will, will help. Um, finally, the whole point of this is to keep from sending lots of raw data. So think carefully about how you're structuring your data. Think about implementing guardrails to prevent a user in the hub from requesting you know, a select star scenario, requesting all of the log data at once. Put in place some of those guardrails, and that's going to be particularly important as you start expanding usage, kind of beyond some of your most sophisticated analysts and into more of a uh, citizen operator. Because you do want to start thinking also about some of these less advanced, less sophisticated users, whether that's by building data visualization tools, whether that's a library of queries that someone can come in and use, because we really do want to be able to tackle a broad range of, of applications. So I'll, I'll hand it back over to Tim to talk about some of the organizational jujitsu that was required to make this happen. Thank you. Thanks, Ed. All right, so as Ed just kind of talked through some of the technical approaches, um, I'll, I'll cover a few highlights in terms of where we've gone with the organizational uh, challenges and how we've approached them. Um, and this will really build on some of the points I made earlier. So um, I won't cover everything on this slide, but ultimately, um, as I mentioned earlier, we knew how important executive sponsorship and oversight is in this process. And so from the very beginning, we established a steering committee. Um, we in the government love steering committees. Uh, and we called it the Lake House Over, Over Group or Oversight Group or LOG. Um, of course, we also love acronyms. So the LOG is a group kind of cross-cutting in our organization, um, security, IT, business, policy, all of those different groups together at the senior most level that can provide direction and feel invested from the beginning. Um, we worked with the right parties to update existing policies, and we actually developed a new policy that um, explicitly directs compliance and explains the benefits of uh, mandatory participation for those system owners. Um, and that's really key, you know, so, so the, the message was you must do this, but it's actually good for you. And to get to that, it's actually good for you part, we've been working closely with a lot of the different groups in the organization, in particular our systems accreditation offices, to say how can we provide through this lake house architecture to the system owners inherited common controls, right? So as they're getting their systems for those that deal with the authority, authority to operate ATO process. As they're going through that, you need to speak to how are you managing and securing your environment? How are you capturing those logs? Um, if we can do that for them through one enterprise centralized solution, it makes that process that much easier for them. Um, so that's really the carrot behind, behind a lot of this. That and, that and of course they don't have to define, build the architecture technically, um, so on and so forth. And there's economies of scale by bringing that into a centralized solution. Um, so that should accelerate systems authorization. Um, in summary, on a couple more points, um, we found defining clear roles and responsibilities is key in this process, um, getting that executive sponsorship and support, updating policies, as I mentioned, or creating new ones so that you align to the mandate, um, and providing guidance to those system owners so that they, they're along with you on this journey and they don't have to figure it out. Um, I would recommend starting small. Um, we have tried to identify very scoped deliverables, so we're a year plus into this initiative, and we've already shown some tangible successes. We actually have some of our security folks using the environment, running some analysis today, while we know that there's still a lot more to be done. Um, so start small and grow from there. Um, finally, 
we believe this, this solution will scale beyond this initial mandate, right? That it can do much more. It can provide our system owners with insights into the performance, health, and of course security of their environment, their systems. Um, and of course it brings that centralized federated oversight and analysis across the environments, uh, which will avoid some of that cost of duplicating and copying our data. So that's kind of where we are in this journey. We've got a long ways to go, but we're excited about uh, you know, what, what we've accomplished so far. We're excited about what Databricks has been able to do in supporting this solution and uh, look forward to taking any questions you all might have. Thank you.